So I don't know about you, but sometimes I can kind of be nostalgic. I just like old stuff. Um, actually, I don't like very much stuff or things very much at all. I tend to focus on people, right? But the stuff that I do like tends to be older stuff, okay? Uh, one of the most prized possessions I ever had, for example, was this old steel latch Coleman cooler that my grandmother gave to me and that I passed on to our son, Sean. And he told me that last year he took that Coleman cooler with him on a float trip with a bunch of his buddies and it kept the ice longer than all of their newfangled Yeti coolers. <laughs> they just don't make things like they used to, right? Well, I just like things like old cars. Is, yeah, he is here. Steve Trevor is here. I saw his car for the first time at the dog opening last uh, year, and I said, man, that's awesome. <laughs> So I like old cars, I like old coins, uh, old music, um, mid-century furniture, uh, and pretty much all of the styles and the designs of the 50s and 60s, right? Uh, and I guess I'm just as nostalgic as the next person about my childhood as well. Uh, over our sabbatical this last summer, uh, Kim and I were able to take a two-day trip over to Indiana, where most of you know by now, I think, I grew up. And I was able to take her for the very first time to the little county seat town of Shelbyville, where I lived when I was about from the age of six until the age of 11, from the first through the fifth grades in elementary school. And I was absolutely amazed that after having literally not been in Shelbyville since I was 11 years old, that all of the names of the main streets there I could remember. And that without Googling at all, I could drive straight to the two houses that we lived in when we were there and the two elementary schools that I went to and attended and most importantly, to the boys club, where my brother and I basically went every single day after school. It was a great trip of going down memory lane, if you will, as I was able to share with Kim for the first time all of these places that she's heard me talk about all of these years. Well, likewise, I enjoy hearing all of the fond memories that other people have about how things were for them when they were growing up. And I certainly enjoy hearing all of the stories about how things were here at St. John's back in the glory days, if you will, right? When there were 2,000 members here, and basically everybody in South County knew who we were, right? Well, by the time our scripture from the book of Isaiah this morning was written, as it turns out, the people of Israel were more than nostalgic for probably, and had been, for probably the better part of a hundred years. They had been longing for the good old glory days of King David and King Solomon. They were probably two or three generations into being repatriated back to Jerusalem and uh, after they had been conquered and exiled by the Babylonians. And they were in the thick of trying to rebuild their holy city and their lives back in their homeland, which as you might imagine was much easier said than done. Things were much different 
and the task of rebuilding with the city laying in ruins seemed completely insurmountable. And of course, they didn't have the resources that they had back in the glory days. And therefore, they were in desperate need of some kind of vision and some kind of word of hope. And as we heard, it was exactly into these disheartening and discouraging circumstances that Isaiah offered just that word of hope that they needed. He told them that God was about to create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, I don't know if you caught it or not, that would be a joy to all the people. So much so, actually, that Isaiah says that the good old days of your wouldn't even be remembered. And slowly but surely, one step at a time, indeed, God helped them not only rebuild the city, but also rebuild the temple and uh, rebuild their kingdom. And while the kingdom certainly was much different, the new kingdom, than it had been before, nonetheless, over time, eventually, the people started thinking and focusing way much more on the future and way much less on being nostalgic about the past. And I just have to say that that's exactly how I've experienced all of you all to be in the years that we've been able to share together here at St. John's. Basically, from the day we walked through the door, I've experienced you to basically be, for lack of a better way of saying it, rip-roaring and ready to go, right? Now, certainly you all have made it clear to me that you missed some of the old glory days, but not to the point where you're trying to make the future days be exactly like those old glory days. Instead, you've been wonderfully flexible open to trying new things and to trusting uh, that God, no matter what, is with us every step along the way and to trusting that we are indeed living in new and different times. And I just want you to know that that's all that's required, not only of us, but of any church for that matter, to trust and believe that we serve God who is never not doing or creating something new. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Ishmael and Israel is ever creating something new. The God of Joseph and Mary and Jesus and Peter and Paul is ever creating something new. The God of all of the popes and all of the reformers and the church universal is ever creating something new. The God of Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and he of all people and all creation on all the earth and throughout the universe is ever creating something new. And our job, always and ever, is simply to keep our hearts wide open and ready for the work of our ever creative and creating God, both within us and beyond us, exactly and especially when the temptation is to otherwise be closed or harden our hearts. And I just want you to know this morning that I'm just so incredibly thankful for your open hearts. And I pray that just as change is a constant in life, that our keeping our hearts ever open and ready for our ever creating something new God will also always be a constant in our life as well. Whatever we do, I hope that we will be like the people of Israel in Isaiah's day who kept their hearts very open to receiving this good news that we serve an ever creating uh, something new God and who therefore got the opportunity to have more of a life than at many points along the way they ever thought would ever be possible. I read a devotional this last week that relates to all of this and it was written by a young man named Vince 
Scanlon, who happens to be a young pastor, one of the young pastors at Bethany United Church of Christ in Chicago. And he's one of the regular contributors to the UCC's daily online devotional. And he entitled this devotional, Fluff, F-L-U-F-F, and he based it on um, Jesus' first public statement in the Gospel of Mark, in which you may remember Jesus said, repent or turn around and believe in good news. The kingdom of God is near or is at hand. And Anlin said that there are a ton of studies that show that faced with a crisis, like a natural disaster or a terrorist attack, most people will act in incredibly generous and compassionate ways. They'll share resources and work together and even risk their own lives for strangers. But whether it's in the midst of a crisis or not, Amlin characterized all these stories that we can hear about people doing kind and caring and compassionate things as being what he called fluff. As opposed to the real news, right? Which we all know tends to seem to focus on what's the worst of things and the worst of humanity. And Amlin confessed that he tended to pay more attention to the real news and to sort of dismiss the fluff. But what he went on to point out is that the real news actually, if we think about it, seems to be designed to create fear in folks, which in the way the system works, ultimately tends to help the rich and powerful, if you will, maintain control and gain even more advantage. And so in application with Jesus' first statement in the Gospel of Mark, Amlin says that Jesus is basically inviting us, therefore, to turn around, to repent, or to turn around from the fear-mongering in the real news, if you will, and to instead believe the good news of all of those fluff stories that are out there, our neighbors, Amlin says, are compassionate and loving. The kingdom of God and the world as God envisions it is very close at hand. It's very near. Fluff, from God's perspective, ultimately wins. So believe it. Today, obviously, is our congregational meeting. And on a day such as this, every day, but on a day such as this, we're much more focused, aren't we, on the future and a lot less nostalgic about the past. And as we look to the future, we keep our hearts wide open, not only to God and God's work of ever creating something new, both within us and beyond us, but also to God ever creating a whole lot more fluff within us and beyond us that we truly can believe. Thanks be to God. Amen.